Kingdom leadership has little to do with title or office. In fact, kingdom leadership, if you actually look at it, is picking up the mantle of responsibility for the care of God's people. In some cases, you will have a, a title and an office and position. In other cases, you'll simply live out the life of a kingdom leader simply where you are looking after God's people. I think leadership in the church is much like an iceberg. About one-eighth of, 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 of an iceberg is above the water, and about seven-eighths is, is below the water. I, I think it's that same way in the church. I, I think that there'll be a portion of the leadership that's above water and visible, and people will call them by names, and there'll be elders, and so, so, so it goes. But I think there are people who will be doing the exact same thing, who will never be seen, applauded into heaven. When we talk about leadership, I am convinced that when you pick up the mantle of responsibility for the care of God's people, you simply choose an intersection or two. It'll, it, it'll seldom just be one. But you choose a place or two that you work out of, and these skills, the ministry of prayer, the ministry of compassion, the ministry of the word, and the ministry of duplication, just helping people to figure out how to do and how to see and live out of the very things that you're doing. Let's spend a little bit of time on this ministry of prayer. I assume there's several ways that I could probably talk through the scriptures with you uh, on this session. But if you don't mind, and if you'll forgive me a little bit, I guess I just probably, probably want to tell you a personal story. I want to tell you where my life changed on this and just talk through my own life. I've been in doing kingdom leadership for a long time. I, I had started back in the early uh, 1970s being somebody's minister, way, way too early. But I enjoyed it, and, and good things happened out of it, and God blesses fools and children, and my story's kind of one of those. But let me go to the 90s. I'd done kingdom work, but in the 90s, a situation opened up, a, a situation that occurred that involved an incredible opportunity in our town for a unity among multiple denominations. I, I had people from all kinds of backgrounds that were in leadership who, who would sit down over a cup of coffee and they would say, how can you be Christians only? And how can you begin to, to, to drop away the denominational trappings and just be Christ followers? And I realized God had opened a door that I didn't know that I was capable enough to walk through. Here's where I need you to cut me some slack, but I just want to tell the story. It was the first time that I decided to do an extended fast. I knew I was over my head on the opportunity, and so I decided to do a fast. Fasting, by the way, is not hard. Um, cutting food back is hard. Cutting food out is not hard. I, I don't think heaven keeps any record of extended fast. I, I don't think... Uh, it's, in, in the grand scheme of things, nothing that will be on heaven's walls. So, so I don't in any way want you to hear any, any, anything out of this. I don't intend. But I end up doing a 40-day fast. That 40-day fast was one of the most powerful things in my life, but it comes back to this issue of prayer. When, when you do a, an extended fast, uh, one of the misnomers that you have is that you skip all meal times and go off and pray. Well, you might if you're going to do a one to two or three or four day fast or something. But if you're going to do 40 day fast, you, you don't skip the meals, meal times, because that's where your family and friends are. And that's where you connect with people. And so what you'd do is you'd go set and drink an iced tea or something at a, at a, at a meal with, with your friends. It's not a big deal. Nobody notices. Nobody cares. It's, 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 not, it's nothing. But what I did do is I would take a couple, three hours every afternoon, and I would go off for an extended time to pray. I happened to have a job that let me do that. Well, it was February, and instead of going off on a prayer walk, I would go off on a prayer drive so I can keep my heater on. And so I would drive away from the building, the, the church, because there's just too much commotion and noise there. And I would go sit in a neighborhood, and I just began to pray. And I began to pray about the opportunities God had opened. I began to pray about our church and the life and ministry. And, and then I realized, I think, a conviction by the Spirit that, that, yes, I knew about prayer. I've taught on prayer. I've written prayer notes. I, but I wasn't sure that I knew how to play 
kingdom prayers. And so I simply began to take all of Paul's prayers. And there's a series of Paul's prayers, and I began to memorize them. And as I began to memorize them, a conviction began to roll over me that I was praying the kinds of prayers that Randy would pray, but I wasn't praying the kinds of prayers that the kingdom would pray. And it wasn't the kind of prayers Paul prayed. And as I memorized those prayers, I began to realize Paul has this lifestyle that of all the things Paul is, he's a man who prays for people. In fact, almost all of his letters, they, they almost all start off with, I've been praying for you, and I want you to know what I've been praying for. And then he lists them out. Uh, you can see those prayers. Uh, they'll be in, for example, Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3, and they're in, in, in Philippians 1, and they're in Colossians 1, and they're in Philemon, and they're in Romans. And, and Romans uh, will have it like in chapter 1. It'll have it again in chapter 15. You're going to, on and on, Paul, Paul's praying for people. Today's not the day to go through all those prayers. But what I can tell you is that I begin to notice that Paul had a bit of a template, things that he thought were so vital he wanted to pray about. Now, I don't know how you're going to list them out if you would, but I would encourage you, take your own Bible, go through Paul's prayers, and you ask yourself, is this how I pray for people? Is this what I do? And I, ran, I found 8 to 12 things, depending on, how, again, how you want to list them. I would call it 12 to 13 things, but, but I, others might list it different. That was his template. Well, I simply said I, I, I wouldn't begin to do that. Anywhere I was parked in my car in the town that we live in, I, I, I knew at least a house or two that I could see that I knew the people who lived in those houses. And since Paul wrote letters to people and told them he'd been praying for them, and, and then he told them what he'd been praying for, I just began simply to write a, a few notes to the houses that I knew. I remember the very first one, a Stan and Ellie's house. And I just began to pray. I, I, the note was very simple. I, I, I used my own words. I didn't use Paul's words. But I just said I had the opportunity to think about them. And as I had seen their house, I, again, I didn't tell them I was stalking them, set in the neighborhood. But, but as I had seen their house, I just had thought of the joy and laughter in that home. And I thought, and I began to take two or three things. I didn't take all 12 or 13. I took two or three things out of Paul's prayer, and I prayed for that home. I prayed for great joy and laughter in that home. And I prayed that the power of God, and I, and I just took Paul's prayers in my own words. I began to do that every day. It didn't take long. But here, to follow my metaphor, I was in an intersection of people I knew and loved, and I just began to invest in a life of prayer. You need to know what happened. I, I would go to church then where I would see these people, or I would get a phone call. And I've written prayer notes for years, but they would grab me in a hallway and take me into a classroom and just begin to open up their chest and talk. It was sometimes gratitude, sometimes it was brokenness, sometimes it was a sense of some grand dream God had put. And I went, wow, you mean praying for people and praying kingdom prayers that are less Randy type prayers. God, you really do something in people's lives. Yeah, I do. Yeah. That all the other things you do are pretty peripheral, but this is the thing. If I take the story a bit further, I was finishing up the 40 days fast when I had a seminar to hold at a, at a, at a congregation a couple hundred miles from home. I had told the minister that I was doing a fast and that on the seminar I'd prefer not to have meals. I didn't want to make any deal out of it. Don't announce it. Don't say it. Don't, don't, just, 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 just leave it behind the scenes. But I also wanted to meet people. I, I wanted to know people. That's where you get to know people is over meals. So how's, how am I get to know his families and, and yet not have meals? And so I, I think the Lord nudged me on this. And so I said to him, I don't know if they'll sign up or not, but would you tell them instead of meals that I would love to, if families would be interested, that the one thing, there's not a lot of things that I can do when I come into a community, but one of the things I can do is pray for people. Would you be willing, would you be interested in, in us just sitting down and praying together? I thought maybe two or three odd families might ask. 
and say, yeah, that'd be fine. I was pretty shocked. Every slot, 15 or 16 slots that were available, the, every slot was taken. The very first home I went to was about 3.30 in the afternoon on the first day. They hadn't even met me before. It was the right after work. A man had gotten off his job. The preacher of that congregation said, I'm sorry, but I can't even go with you on the first one. We've had a crisis of a, of, a, of a lady, and I've got to meet at the hospital with the family. Do you mind going and praying with that family by yourself? And I said, no, I'd be happy to. I, it didn't scare me. So I went to a family I didn't know. I knocked on the door. They opened the door. There's a husband and a wife and, and probably a sixth grade, seventh grade boy and a second grade girl and just a, just a family. They invited me in, and we sat there, and I just introduced myself and asked a little bit about them. And, and as we talked just a little bit, I said, well, it's, again, not a lot of things that I can do, but one of the things I can do is pray for people. And I, I didn't want to come to a community that I at least didn't pray. So I began to pray. I prayed for them by name. I prayed just a little bit, not, not long, not super spiritual words. I don't even know a lot of those words. And, and so I'm praying with them. And there's no exaggeration when I tell you one of the most shocking ends of a prayer I've ever had. When I said amen, there was an audible gasp as the father began to weep out loud and grab his sixth grade, seventh grade son and pull him to his chest. And the father began to say, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. And in the seventh grade, sixth grade son, kind of got down to his knees by his dad and said, Dad, I know you are, but your anger is killing us. Dad, your temper is killing this family. And the wife, they, they ignored me. The wife slipped over and sat down beside her husband, and she said, we love you. All of us love you, but your temper. And, and I watched something play out as a man repented in front of his family for his temper. They sort of remembered I was there. The man began to say, three days ago, I lit into my son verbally, and I am so sick at what I did. Started a bit of a dialogue, end up working with that family a little bit longer on another occasion then. But you didn't have to do much because repentance turned a family in incredible ways. I don't want to tell you out of the 15 or 16 appointments that I was able to have in those three or four days, I, I don't want to tell you that everyone was like that, but I'm going to tell you the Lord must have thought I was a slow learner because gave me about a dozen of them that had a similar kind of thing. It rocked me back. And I realized that discipling people in the group mass ways that we often do with trying to make changes from the stage and all the stuff we do and all of the hallway conversations. And I believe in preaching and teaching, but they paled on the impact of somebody just sitting down in a home and praying. I changed my whole style of ministry as a result of the Lord sort of leading me this. There's not a lot of things that I can do in life, but one of the things I can do is pray for people. And so one of the things that I would do is simply choose the people at the intersection I'm at. I will pray for you. I will pray consistently for you. Not every day. I get mixed. I, I keep a list. But not only will I pray for you and pray these kingdom prayers that Paul might have, but here's what I'll also do. I'm going to find a way to pray with you. And not to embarrass you, not to make you pray. And so it's easy to call a man and say, John, I, I just think the Lord sort of brought your name to mind, and I've always enjoyed and appreciated, and thank you. John, John, are you available for a cup of coffee after work tomorrow? One of the things I'd be honored to do is just I'd love to hear a little more of what's going on in your life, and I'd love the privilege of praying with you. Whenever I live my life at my intersection, I believe that praying with and for people is one of the things that is the stewardship that God gave to all, to all leaders. And if we're not people of prayer, and I'm not talking about at the communion service, I'm not talking about the introduction to a worship service, I'm talking about praying for people. 
We recognize that the, the body of Christ, the church, it's not a location like a building. It's far more organic. When Jesus said, my, my people will be a people of prayer as he cleansed the temple, is there not an indictment to those of us who may live a life that doesn't have enough prayer? So how do you do this? Well, I'm going to just simply encourage you. Would you take what Paul has prayed? You certainly take what Jesus has prayed. But you could take Paul's prayers, it is incredibly easy, and you simply take a week or two and you study them and you write them out and you look at them and you pray with them, pray through them. And when you get done, if you haven't decided that the places God has placed you, that I could begin to live a gentle, non-spotlight kind of life, but I will pray for people. I have been doing this a lot through the years. I suspect the one thing that I have heard from more young leaders that I've worked with in gratitude and appreciation is this, is when I figured out the lifestyle of my life had to incorporate praying with and for people, it changed everything about how my ministry went, about how my Christian life went. May we be a people of prayer.